Welcome to a special AAEP convention edition of Equa Management's podcast, Disease Du Jour, brought to you by Decra Veterinary Products. This special episode's guest is Dr. Kent Allen, owner of Virginia Equine Imaging in Middleburg, Virginia, and we will be discussing the equine neck. Allen received his DVM from the University of Missouri in 1979, and he has been practicing equine medicine ever since. Allen opened Virginia Equine Imaging in 1996 after selling the practice he formerly owned in Arizona. Virginia Equine Imaging became the first privately owned and operated equine diagnostic imaging specialty clinic in the world. He had a vision to establish a practice that provided advanced diagnostics in sports medicine, focused on the equine athlete in a way that had never been done before. During his transition from Arizona to Virginia, Allen served as the head veterinary services coordinator at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. Since moving to Virginia and establishing Virginia Equine Imaging, Allen has served as the chairman of the USEF Veterinary Committee, the USEF Drug and Medication Committee, and the Medication Subcommittee for the FEI. He served as the FEI Foreign Veterinary Delegate for the 1999 Pan America Games in Winnipeg, Canada, and the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, and at the 2012 Olympic Games in London. Allen also was the 2010 World Equestrian Games Official Veterinary Coordinator. Allen is certified by the International Society of Equine Locomotor Pathology, or ICELP, and serves as its Vice President and Executive Director. He also serves as Volunteer Chairman of the USEF Veterinary, Drug, and Medications Committees, and on the FEI Veterinary and List Committees. Allen continues to see patients and impart his knowledge to veterinary interns and clients on a day-to-day basis, striving to share his knowledge with the equine industry both in his local community and around the world. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for joining us today to talk about the equine neck. Happy to be here, Kim, and it's an interesting area, so we won't have any difficulties finding something to talk about. That's right, and one of the reasons we chose this is that ICELP at the 2019 AAEP convention is having a, an amazing wet lab on the neck and the back, and we're just going to touch on just a tip of this, but I would uh, highly encourage any of our listeners, if you ever have the opportunity to go to an ICELP wet lab, that they are fabulous. And I'm I'm guessing that this one has already been sold out. So here you're going to get a little sneak peek from one of the presenters behind the scenes. So Dr. Allen, let's... Yeah, unfortunately it is sold out. You're right, Kim. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But but still, we'll, we'll try to impart a little bit of knowledge here as we're doing this. Great. Okay, well, let's jump right in and let's talk a little bit about neck arthritis. Well, and the the cervical spine is, you know, a complex area. Uh, There's seven cervical vertebrae, a lot of articular, um, some are synovial articulations, others are the central articulations with the disc, and they're wider and longer than what you see in the back and and through the lumbar and thoracic areas. So it, it's, like I say, an interesting area. And because it's got the nuchal ligament coming up dorsally, um, you know, from the withers all the way up to the pole, um, and that is the longest ligament in the body. And then it's got several muscles of which you know, we deal with and we see muscular um, damage to those, but the real thing that you see is you're looking at a horse and you're trying to assess it. Could it have a neck problem? Could it have arthritis in its neck? And that can present, you know, occasionally as a lameness, a front end lameness. And, you know, occasionally as neurological, but it can also present as kind of a stiff neck and difficulty turning one direction or another. But another thing that's simple to look for, because we know these major muscle groups here, the brachiosphalicus, the splenius, and the serratus ventralis, we look at those and we go, are those normal? Do those, is there unilateral or bilateral muscle atrophy? And that's an easy way to just get an idea as to whether or not you may have a neck problem on this horse. 
you know, the horse is well muscled everywhere else, but it has very little muscle and looks kind of thin through its neck. You may want to start worrying about does this horse have some arthritic problems? And again, it will present commonly as poor performance, like almost any of the axial skeleton area, uh, the neck, the back, uh, the SI, those really aren't lameness issues. And like I say, occasionally, and the neck probably being number one, can present as a front limb lameness issue. But more commonly, it's poor performance, or the horse's bridle lame, or difficulty stiff bending one direction or another, or as you try to engage the horse on the bit, particularly the English performance horse, you'll have some reluctance to bring the horse back and the, the head and the neck back into the frame. The horse seems to resist that. Um, so that's a common thing. So like I say, you look for this neck muscling, the carriage, the posture, you want to palpate and and see if you can feel, you know, those those uh, facets are very large and prominent. You can palpate those uh, through the neck musculature, and of course it's easier if they're atrophied. And then we do dynamic evaluation. We'll flex it, and then we'll ride the horse, see what the rider's talking about, and get them to show it to us. And then sometimes we'll lunge it as well and be able to see it. Um, and so you can see these horses where, you know, they're you're offering them a carrot or something, and they just they're not going to bring their. They should be able to go back to almost their flank in a normal situation. In an abnormal horse, you know, there's times they won't even come to the shoulder. A normal horse, you should be able to, you know, offer it a treat that it likes, it wants to eat and get it to follow your hand back almost to the flank. Um, Now, and it should be able to do that equally both directions. You have to make sure you're motivating the horse (laughs) so you don't get a false read. But if you can do that, then when you're doing that with the abnormal horse, you'll see it wants to follow that tree, but it can't do it. It can't bend its neck around. It's too painful. And so you'll see horses that can barely get to the shoulder, um, much less the flank, wow. and, or they'll be one-sided, they'll be stiff one way and not stiff on the other direction. Yeah. So that's, a, that's an interesting finding, a simple way to do it, you know. It, it, all the equipment it takes is, uh, you know, your hands, your eyes, someone helping you, and a carrot. Um, so no high-tech there. Um, so, and, and we can, once we think that's the problem, then you've got a variety of ways to look at it. And you can do it with an x-ray, um, and portable x-rays can, uh, easily go from the pole to about two-thirds of the way down, um, a well-muscled adult horse. Now, as you get to that base of the neck, it's hard to do it with a portable x-ray. The amount of musculature just starts defeating you. Um, But you can do it with a larger in-clinic machine, which can easily go down to C7, T1, and beyond. Um, Or you can switch to an ultrasound, and an ultrasound will let you see that um, in those areas at, at C7, T1. And the other advantage to the ultrasound is you get to see all the margin, you get to see the joint capsule, the effusion, and it has good correlation with pathology. Um, and it's, it's not gonna be limited by the muscle. The other advantage with ultrasound evaluation of the cervical spine is that that's what we're going to utilize to guide a needle into those facets and to inject it with a variety of different uh, preparations. Okay. 
so and one of the other things that we can talk about that these horses will get and you can look at this with x-ray or ultrasound is the pole so not at the base of the neck but at the very top and you can see the nuchal ligament you can see the another small ligament there that goes off to the sides the semispalinalis capitis and then at the bottom the rectus capitis um so there's numerous structures there you can look at at the pole and sometimes you'll see that attachment at the uh at the where the nuchal ligaments coming into the pole and there's all sorts of uh, irritated bone there and sometimes even fragmentation and that can be very painful you know to the horse that's you know crunching and feeling weird and, and it's not wanting to bring its head down and get into a frame it'll resist that actively for you <clears throat> so the other areas that again at the base of the neck and without a doubt the the majority of the arthritis of the articular facets tend to be in that lower third of the neck um and and they're really important because you know we can visualize the outside of those articular facets but where we're gonna have some trouble is visualizing the inside of it. And you'll have, you can see it some with an X-ray, you're fairly limited on seeing that area with an ultrasound. Um, but, and then the other thing that you can see it quite well on is a CT, and those exist now that can do, um, look at the neck in a 3D cross section uh, in the standing horse. So that's really nice that we can do that without general anesthesia because if the horse is a little ataxic, well, probably the last thing we want to do is give it general anesthesia and recover it from that. Right. So we try to look at these non-invasively as much as we can. An ultrasound's a tremendous tool for that. And you can see the, the facet, um, the joint space, uh, we can see whether or not there's a fusion or there's periarticular remodeling and capsulitis. Um, so we can see all that. Um, and, and it's great. And then, like I say, if we're talking about the radiology, um, you know, we can see these postural abnormalities. Sometimes if as we bend the neck and do an x-ray, sometimes you can see the vertebral body slip up into a position that's not gonna be healthy for the cord. Um, and you can have problems that way. And again, you'll have an, an articular problem where, um, you know, we were talking about arthritis earlier. And so you can, Juvenile wobblers is usually a malposition of the cord and an impingement of the spine. When the horses get older, that's unusual to see. And what's more common is this arthritic change that's happening at the base of the neck. And again, as we try and think of this and visualize it in a 3D cross-sectional manner, what you think of is well yeah that's arthritic on the outside of that facet but that may be arthritic on the inside and the inside is in contact with the spine and so sometimes it's a synovial membrane that's pushing out into the cord and sometimes it's actual bone either way the horse is going to resist that and sometimes be neurological over that now we have a short word from our sponsor before we continue our interview. Decra Veterinary Products is the U.S. Sales and Marketing Division of Decra Pharmaceuticals PLC, a U.K. listed company dedicated to the animal health care market. Decra sells and markets Osphos, the only intramuscular bisphosphonate indicated to help control the clinical signs associated with navicular syndrome in horses four years and older. 
Decker was the first to bring iRap to the U.S. regenerative market in two sizes for easy processing. These products include Orthokine Vet iRap 10 and Orthokine Vet iRap 60, as well as their double spin high platelet rendering PRP kit, Osteokine. Other Decker products include Equidone Gel for fescue toxicosis and peripartuant mares, the Vetivex line of IV fluids, and their equine joint supplements Phycox EQ and EQ Max. Now, the good news is if it's just the synovial membrane, you can treat that. Um, and you can do that with cortisone injection into that area. And if the horses respond to that, then you can think about doing it with regenerative therapies, which may last much longer and actually tighten that joint and that facet down, and the horse will do better in the long run. Um, and there were some studies done in England with this um, that you know some veterinarians looked at a large group of horses, and in England, it's a great place to do an experiment like this because they don't have EPM. And so once you take the EPM variable out of there and you're just talking about arthritis, then the question is, okay, you give it a cortisone injection into a known arthritic, can you make that neurological deficit go away? And what they found in this large group of horses is yes, they could in about 70% of the horses. Um, and that is very important to us on a clinical basis because that means some of these horses that have low-grade um, neurological problems that aren't EPM, then those horses can be treated and they can have a high probability that they're going to improve and do much better than you'd expect to. So, you know, it's important to use a variety of these tools, um, x-rays, ultrasound, to look at these areas of both the neck, the pole, and going back to the pole for a second, um, the, the other beauty of it is that the pole, that arthritic area that I was talking to you about, and, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, all we could do is inject that with cortisone. But nowadays, we can shockwave that, and these horses respond very nicely to shockwave. Some of them I've only treated once, and they were great, and we never had to treat them again. Um, but others you'll have to do at, say, three month intervals. Um, and be aware, too, and, and this is a little bit of an arguable thing in the literature, but you can use other tools as well. Nuclear scintigraphy is very useful on looking at neck arthritis if you do both sides of it and compare, and you're very careful about it, uh, because the changes may be subtle, and sometimes nuclear scintigraphy can underrepresent them that you may be able to see better with an x-ray or an ultrasound but it'll give you an indication as to whether or not you're heading down that right area um, and that's the problem and so if you talk about therapy you know the number one thing we use particularly for the facets is ultrasound guided injection and cortisone is probably the first and but prp alpha 2 macroglobin uh, a variety of the regenerative therapies work quite well. Shockwave works well. Mesotherapy, which is a technique to kind of um, block pain in an area, only works in the axial skeleton area, but it will work well as um, additionally. Um, so, you know, like I say, there's a variety of tools to use. Um, and if there's muscle loss in that area, then sometimes we'll use functional electric stem to get those muscles to grow back, and that you can do that. And so the key on it is learning how to do these injections. 
and that takes some practice again like Tim was talking about um, you know you can learn that at an ISELP meeting AEP has some great meetings they do as well um, and so a high quality um, you know continuing education where you can really learn how to do that learn the anatomy not just not just sticking needles in there learn where the anatomy is because there's some significant areas you not only want to know where they are but there are other areas you want to stay away from um, and there are obviously uh, cervical nerves in that area that are going you know a significant difference and there's uh, cervical arterioles uh, so you want to stay away from all that stuff so it's something that it's not impossible to learn it's very doable I can tell you we if a week in our practice doesn't go by and we haven't done two or three ultrasound guided dorsal articular set injections it would be an unusual week so you know that's kind of and, and pardon me for rattling on here Kim but I just wanted to give people an overview of what we see and do and how we diagnose and treat neck arthritis in the horse. Well, I mean, that's why people want to tune in and listen to people like you, Dr. Allen, to understand, you know, what is possible, how to learn how to do it, and, you know, the the ways that, that horses can be helped. I think uh, because there is so much EPM in this country that a lot of people will perhaps maybe misdiagnose or maybe have both uh, going on at once and with what you're saying they could actually be helping some of these horses that that may have some of this um, vertebral arthritis that could be actually helped you're exactly right and and that's the confusing part in this country where we have EPM is it it pays to be able to differentiate and and one thing i'll tell you because this is spoken about as well but you know you there are people out there who will block the articular facets in the neck and trying to differentiate that but the danger of that is that again on the inside of that facet joint is the cord and so potentially you can paralyze the horse and i can tell you that's happened multiple times luckily not to me but um i've certainly heard multiple stories of it i won't do that i will do everything else i can to diagnose it as either an epm case and i think most of us would be fairly familiar with how we do that serology and lumbosacral taps and that sort of thing and then, then this other whole aspect of it, of differentiating from the arthritis and using ultrasound and x-ray and then uh, potentially treating that. But, you know, there are people who do the blocks, but I will tell you that's a dangerous road to go down. Well, and it seems like with all of the uh, diagnostics that we have today, being able to go in and, and look at the neck, as you mentioned, some can be done in the field and some need to be done, you know, in the clinic, but there's a lot of options for veterinarians to be able to either do it themselves or send a horse to a referral center to to get deeper into that diagnosis of if the neck is involved rather than just EPM. Yeah, you're exactly right. There are lots of other things you should be considering besides EPM. And so, you know, given the horse, um, medications for that is great if that's the problem but if either that's not working or that's not the problem you need to be considering these other things and i had just one more question dr allen with some of these you know performance horses uh whether they're backyard horses or or you know olympic caliber and we're talking about arthritis and people start thinking well arthritis really doesn't start bothering a horse until it gets into its mid to late teens are you seeing arthritis in any younger horses? Yes, and again, that's back to this issue of is the arthritis, 
you know, wear and tear disease or is it a developmental problem? The developmental problems are obviously all happening when they're very young. And then those can develop arthritis fairly quickly because of the abnormal um, confirmation of that facet or an OCD fragment in that facet or a cyst. Anything like that will cause a problem, and those horses become arthritic at fairly young ages, um, and then go through the whole process, and again, can still be helped. And uh, I mean, the, the one I remember was actually a horse I owned um, that, you know, amazingly enough, my son and, and this horse, he was, my son was riding this horse, he took a jump the wrong direction, um, as teenage boys will occasionally do, did a rotational fall with the horse, luckily was thrown away from it, so he was fine, the horse popped up and was fine, and we went back and everything seemed good, you know, the horse was fine, and about six months later, a rider was riding this horse for us and said, seems kind of stiff, and I said, oh, let me look at it. I'd look at it, sure enough, it is stiff, turn in one direction, and I go x-ray that neck, and that horse has fractured an articular facet. Wow. Um, really didn't give much sign of it. Uh, wasn't all that painful, really, not to the point that anyone picked up on it. Um, and all I did was inject that, and that horse continued to do well for a number of years really didn't have much in the way of problems. And, you know, we know exactly when it did this. So these horses can suffer these injuries and, you know, then get the accompanying arthritis that comes with it, be it young or old, and still do pretty well. And if you treat them, they do even better. So there, there's lots of options for these horses. This doesn't have to be the end of the road. Well, that's great to know, and thank you very much for joining us today to talk about the equine neck, and we sure certainly will be talking to you about some of these other uh, areas in the future, and we want to thank all of you for joining us for this special edition of uh, Disease Du Jour coming from the AAEP convention. We thank Dr. Allen for joining us today. And make sure and listen to all three AAEP convention special podcasts brought to you by Decker Veterinary Products. You can listen to or download episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again in the future.